assume everyone uh, is already here. So um, I'm Nigel. Uh, I've been working on Multipath TCP uh, and implementation for FreeBSD uh, for a couple of years now. Um, so uh, today, basically, um, <clears throat> I'll be going through about uh, a little bit about what the current state is of the implementation. Um, but of course, uh, Multipath TCP is not sort of generally uh, People don't generally know the protocol in and outs, um, so I'll spend a little bit of time talking about uh, the actual protocol itself, uh, and then kind of an overview um, of the implementation uh, in terms of uh, what's, what's kind of changed from how, how did things work uh, with standard TCP and what's changed for, uh, to enable multipath. Uh, and hopefully if I have enough time, uh, which I should have, uh, I've got basically a simple topology at the end, um, something that uh, when you eventually uh, when, when, the, when the next patch comes out, there's sort of some documentation and there's a simple example of topology um, for setting up some VMs and doing some multipath stuff. And I'll kind of just show uh, a little bit about how that works. Um, so just on me, uh, it's not too much exciting there really. Uh, I did an undergrad in uh, telecommunications engineering uh, and networks. Uh, when I graduated, did a couple of years of uh, network research, so in classification stuff, um, in QoS stuff. Uh, and then I left for a while and did some, you know, totally random kind of uh, tangent uh, career things uh, before eventually coming back to the network research a couple of years ago. Um, and that's when I kind of got back into uh, this multipath TCP stuff. Um, and at the moment I'm completing a master's uh, degree, so postgrad, uh, and I think it's called Research Enabling Multipath TCP for FreeBSD or something uh, along those lines. So uh, on the implementation itself, um, given that uh, we're a research lab, um, our first kind of priority was how, how can we make something uh, that we can use to do more network research, um, particularly with multipath, it's quite new. Um, there's a lot of different scenarios in which you can use it. Um, there's not one simple solution for all of this. Uh, there's things to consider in terms of congestion control and how to schedule uh, data segments and how to manage paths and all of that kind of stuff. So. For us, it would be useful to have uh, an implementation that kind of makes it easy uh, for us to, you know, push push different buttons and pull levers uh, and have different thing, things happen. Uh, but it's not just about being a research tool. It's also something that should uh, hopefully be something that people can use. So uh, if you uh, have a particular use case in mind at some point in the future and if the FreeBSD multipath uh, stack is, helps with that, then, you know, that's a good outcome as well. And the last thing uh, is uh, interoperable uh, with the current uh, reference implementation and whichever other implementations pop up. So there is a Linux implementation at the moment. And um, being able to interoperate with that, you know, helps with uh, standardization and that sort of thing. So kind of a bit of background. And um, so I might as well say there's a, there's a couple of slides in here uh, which I did, uh, which is very similar to what I presented a few years ago uh, when I was here. but uh, a lot of it has changed since then, so hopefully there's not too much that's uh, too familiar and boring for people who are there. Uh, hopefully there's enough new people uh, that it will all be interesting. So uh, I started working uh, on the implementation uh, in around 2012-ish um, with some funding from Cisco, and that was kind of the idea of, hey, let's uh, get something that we can use for research. Um, so I was working on that primarily. I was getting some help uh, from Lawrence uh, at the time because essentially I just uh, begun kernel development stuff, so for me it was all very new, uh, and getting uh, getting some help with that uh, in, in terms of designing and things like that uh, was crucial, and so Lawrence has helped a little bit with that. Um, so a patch came out, uh, a couple of patches, in fact, in March of 2013, so a little while after we started, I think it might have been 11 or 12 months, um, and those were pretty, pretty rough prototypes. So they did some multi-path stuff, uh, within a very kind of restricted use case um, kind of list. So if you, did, if you did this, it would work. If you did something else, uh, you might get a kernel panic or you might get you know, something crazy happening. Uh, after that, I, I had to switch on to another project. So I was working on that for a year uh, and kind of doing the multipath stuff uh, in my spare time. So there wasn't a, a huge uh, deal of progress over that period um, as I kind of pe pecked away at it. Uh, and then, so last year, in, around in the middle of last year, um, I started doing a, my master's and uh, was fortunate enough for the FreeBSD Foundation to provide some funding for that, so for the first 18 months or so. Um, and 
Uh, Cisco has kind of uh, provided some more funding as well, just for that last few months while I write a thesis. Um, and so at the beginning of that, uh, I was the last patch release, which was version four, we're calling it. Um, and then there's not been any kind of news since then. And I'll go into, into a bit about why that was the case, um, just because basically I've gone through and um, redesigned a lot of the implementation. And so I was hoping by today to have uh, a nice implementation that you could download, a new patch um, with some documentation and some cool graphs, and all of this kind of stuff from testing, but the testing has kind of gone on a little bit longer than hoped, um, as is the case often. And so uh, I'm still testing things, but that new patch should be out quite soon. Okay, so uh, what is multipath TCP anyway? Um, the easiest way to explain it, I guess, in a, in a line is that if you have a host that has multiple interfaces or multiple addresses, uh, it allows you to use those addresses uh, on a standard or on a, on a TCP connection. Um, and there's currently a couple of implementations out there already. So there's the Linux implementation, which came out uh, some years ago, um, but within the last couple of years uh, has been, become pretty feature complete and is quite stable. Um, and then there's some uh, commercial implementations. So uh, the other most known one is Apple's implementation for uh, Siri. Um, I don't think it's used beyond uh, that scope. Um, and I believe Citrix and a couple other companies have uh, uh, load balancers or proxies that they use, um, which use multipath TCP. So uh, why would we want to use multipath TCP? Well, there's a couple of advantages that you can get potentially uh, from using multipath TCP. So the first one is uh, this idea of uh, persistence and redundancy that you don't get with TCP generally. So uh, you might think, uh, you might consider TCP as being, you have two addresses, uh, if one of those interfaces disappears, uh, you need to break that connection, um, that connection doesn't come back, you need to reestablish it. Okay, uh, Multipath has, has, a, has kind of an idea, it's called uh, break before make, where you can, you can lose all of your connections underneath, but you can keep that connection alive for a little while um, if a new interface pops up. So uh, you can resume your connection later. So from the application, you don't need to terminate your TCP session. Uh, it simply stays there, MP TCP keeps it alive. Uh, so the other two here, reduce congestion and increase efficiency. Now it might not necessarily be, be the case all the time, but uh, if used in the right uh, scenarios or if you use the right congestion control uh, or so forth, then um, basically you can uh, uh, reduce congestion, say you've got uh, multiple paths. Um, once a bottleneck, you can use congestion control to steer your traffic away from the congested path and um, and not clog uh, particular paths. Oh, and of course, efficiency. Uh, basically, if you've got this extra capacity there, TCP doesn't usu usually use it, of course. Um, so why not uh, employ that extra path if we can? Okay, so why extend TCP and not make something new? Um, basically, a lot of applications already use TCP, um, so we don't need to modify them in order to use uh, MPTCP. So we can add, add this extra functionality without changing our applications at all. Okay, and, and one of the big considerations uh, when designing the protocol was how can we make it work within the internet as it is today? So how can it be made to work with NAT, uh, middle boxes, which may not like protocols, which are not UDP or TCP? Uh, how do we make it compatible so that we can continue to use it um, basically straight out of the box with a, with a new kernel. Okay, so here's like the basic simple scenario, um, and, and, and it's one of many, of course, but the simplest one we know is that we all have phones uh, with multiple interfaces on them, uh, say cellular and uh, Wi-Fi, and let's say we've got a TCP session, uh, a standard TCP t session on a mobile phone. Okay, uh, if we move out of range of a Wi-Fi access point, uh, then our TCP session is essentially going to end at that point uh, and can't continue. Uh, if we want to continue transferring data, we need to set up a new connection. So in the multipath case, uh, we can set up our connection. Uh, the multipath connection is aware that we've got multiple interfaces in this case. So we've got Wi-Fi and we've got uh, a cellular interface. Um, let's say our Wi-Fi uh, disappears, so we go out of range. Um, it's able to internally then just transfer uh, the, 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 the traffic to the uh, cellular interface. Okay, so there's a little bit of terminology um, that I'm gonna use. One of them is subflows. I'll use that a lot 
So basically, if we look at this picture, we can see how uh, multi-part TCP works. So we have a process and we have a socket. Um, the process says, give me a TCP socket. But what we'll really get underneath is a MPTCP connection. And that MPTCP connection is going to then manage um, a bunch of subflows underneath that kind of transparently um, in order to, to, uh, to, to spread data over multiple paths and so forth. Um, so these green arrows here, uh, there may be one or two or three in this case. We've got subflows sitting on the network. Um, from the network's perspective, that just looks like three unrelated TCP connections. Um, from the processor's perspective here, so the application, uh, the application doesn't know anything about this. It just thinks it's using TCP. Okay, so in order to set up some of this stuff uh, and control these subflows and uh, manage our connections, there needed to be some extra signaling. And so, uh, again, the least intrusive way in terms of um, being compatible with today's internet was to use uh, TCP options to send some extra MPTCP information. So uh, in this case, we've got a new MPTCP option, okay, and within that option, there are a bunch of subtypes. Don't know if you can see them, but they're not super, it's not super critical to see them now, but essentially we've got stuff that sets up new connections, uh, adds new addresses to an existing connection, um, provides some extra accounting information. So I'll talk about how uh, there's an extra sequence space sitting on top of standard TCP, uh, which is used to aggregate data. And we've got a few other connection close things there. So in terms of setting up a connection, um, quite simple, it simply piggybacks on top of TCP's handshake. So uh, one host may send a SIN. Okay, it's gonna add an MP capable. That's the option that says um, I'm capable of using multipath TCP. Uh, if the other box is capable of using multipath TCP, uh, it responds in kind. Um, and then on the, on the ACK, uh, on the last ACK, again, MP capable. Uh, and at that point, the session would be considered a multipath session even though we're only just using one uh, address at this point. So adding in another subflow, well, there's a couple of ways to do that. One way is to, to advertise and say, hey, I've got this particular address available. Uh, if you want, you can connect to it. And so we've got at the top here, um, a host sending an add address option. So we've established that connection. And now in one of the packets, we're saying, in our option space, we're saying, okay, I've got this, I've, I've got an extra address uh, if you want, you can add this into the connection. You can try and connect to me. Okay, so we're doing that on our already established interface here. Okay, uh, if the other box chooses to do so, it can send a, a, a SIM to that new address um, with an MP join. So an MP join uh, strictly relates to adding more subflows into a connection. And again, it goes through the handshake uh, as TCP does. And at, and at this point, then you can say, Okay, now we've got two uh, subflows between interface one and our host B over here, and interface two and our host B over here. Okay, and you don't necessarily have to advertise an address. You can simply uh, join from an address that you have. You can join directly into a connection, um, and there's tokens uh, that are used to identify an incoming SIN. And so if you get a SIN that has an MP join on it, uh, it's got some information about which multipath connection it uh, belongs to. And at that point, uh, host B in this case can say, yeah, I know I've got a connection and I'll continue to join this. Okay, so one of the crucial things about um, multipath TCP is, like, is the accounting. So we've got uh, TCP and we know that TCP uh, has, is a byte stream and then we divide that up into uh, sequence numbers and then we use that to track our segments and do retransmits and all that kind of stuff. Um, what we've got now is that we've got multiple segments, um, multiple TCP subflows, and we need to then aggregate that data again at the receiver, let's say. Um, how do we do that? Um, one, I guess, kind of immediate thought is, well, you can just take a TCP space and spread that out over multiple subflows. Um, can't do that necessarily because you may have a middle box that doesn't like big gaps in a sequence space. Let's say I've sent um, some data on one subflow, uh, sent some on the next subflow, and there's a big jump in the sequence space because of how it's been multiplexed. Okay, uh, a middle box may not like that. So the solution for this was to add an extra level of accounting, so a data level sequence space, uh, which sits above the subflows um, and maps our data as it comes out of the send buffer, say, 
Uh, we map it into our individual subflows. Subflows retain their own regular TCP sequence numbering, so they look like regular TCPs. Uh, and then later on, we take care of aggregating all of those segments together. Since we've got two levels of, of data sequence uh, numbers, or two levels of sequence numbering now, uh, now we need to acknowledge at both levels. So the subflows will continue to send acknowledgments for their subflow level sequence numbers, and the data level um, will also need acknowledgments. And just to kind of visualize this to make it a bit easier, so let's say we've got some data to send. So there's 10 bytes here, say, um, and we've numbered them 1 to 10. So that's the data level sequence numbering. Now we want to map. Uh, that data into two subflows. So in this case, we've got subflow one, subflow two, uh, and we're going to map three, uh, three bytes into each of those subflows. Okay. So uh, the subflows now have their own sequence space. So subflow one is 50, 51, 52. Uh, subflow two is in a different sequence space. Um, but importantly, we've still got our data level kind of sequence numbers preserved here. Okay. In this case. Uh, Subflow 2 uh, has, a, say, a shorter RTT than subflow 1, so that, that that data has arrived before subflow 1, um, in which case we can act at the subflow level because, hey, that stuff's been delivered as far as the subflow is concerned. Um, however, the data level is still out of order at this point, so we need to keep that in uh, reassembly until we receive our bytes <coughs> from subflow 1, uh, in which case everything's in order. We can do a data level act. For seven, and we can do our subflow act as well, the 53 on this subflow. This kind of just shows how it might look in a rough packet framing. So you've got your TCP sequence number, length, and so forth, and then you have an option which specifies what the data level sequence is for this particular data segment, um, and it also includes length and stuff, which I haven't shown. Okay, so congestion control is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, with multipath TCP in that uh, now that we have multiple subflows, we can kind of look across all of these and, and, uh, and basically change our congestion windows based on metrics of different subflows. So say a particular subflow has a lower RTT or anything like that, then we can say, well, across all my subflows, this subflow is performing better. I'm going to increase the uh, congestion window by this much and hopefully send more data uh, on that path. Uh, and that's just by default, of course. You don't necessarily have to do it that way um, because, uh, for example, we've got the default uh, congestion controller which says, well, in bottlenecks, I want to be very fair to other TCPs. So if we have a standard TCP and two subflows here, we want to make sure that they're not uh, summing up to a total greater than that one TCP. Um, but if we don't have bottlenecks, uh, we want to be able to say steer traffic more towards the larger uh, larger pipe in this case. <coughs> so I've talked a bit about adding addresses and data sequence numbers and um, congestion control and scheduling things. Um, so how does that actually work logically or how does it look um, logically? Well, the session control block, it's a little bit like a TCP control block, in fact, very similar. Um, and that's going to take care of all the accounting, so things like uh, you know, what our next uh, data sequence send is or what we're expecting to receive next at the data level. Um, but there's also these other kind of logical components that you wouldn't have uh, in TCP necessarily, um, particularly this path manager. So the path manager is going to be telling our uh, session block, these are the paths that are available, or these are the addresses that I have. Uh, maybe you want to join these. And it can signal and say, you know, uh, use this path now or add this as a backup path or add this into a striped. Um, round robin situation. Uh, we've got a packet scheduler, which basically takes care of a write <coughs> comes in. Uh, which subflow do we send on next? We need to determine that uh, at some point, and the packet scheduler does that. Um, and so for the moment, the built in packet scheduler is just round robining, but that can be other things. And the congestion controller. So do we do a uh, couple of congestion control, or do we just leave all the subflows to do their own kind of uncoupled new Reno? congestion control, um, that can all be defined by the congestion controller. Of course, these things are the intention, I guess, because we want to be able to make this flexible so we can do more experiments, is to have these all as modular devices. So if you want to experiment with 
different path management, so different ways of adding, adding uh, paths into a connection or maybe not adding them into a connection, uh, you can do that. Or if you want to change how packets are scheduled, if you want to say uh, use paths with the lowest RTT first, then uh, a packet scheduler, a modular packet scheduler can do that for you. Uh, and the same with congestion control. <coughs> So as I said, there's been a lot of changes between uh, version 0.4 and 0.5, and it's been a long time between any news uh, about any new patches. So why was that the case? Well, it was kind of a major design rethink. So in releasing 0.4, um, I basically went back and had to assess um, the implementation as to how well it was working and how well could I, uh, for example, maintain this into the future. So uh, merging with head was becoming an issue. Um, things like that. Um, how much time do I need to spend merging things? Uh, how much parallel code do I need to maintain? Um, there are certain advantages in how things were done in that initial patch. Um, but in terms of uh, maintaining and kind of keeping MPTCP code separate from the TCP code, so previously uh, it was very much entwined. Um, there was a lot of overlap. Um, every time something changed in TCP uh, in head, then I would need to make a whole bunch of changes uh, as a result of that. So the, the new approach, and perhaps not the most, uh, well, in terms of uh, performance, it may not be the best approach, but in terms of logically separating things a little bit and being easier to maintain, I think it was a little bit easier uh, and better to change. And, and that required quite a lot of rewriting um, of pretty much all of the code, uh, except for some option parsing. Um, and another benefit of doing it uh, in the way that it is now, that it's a little bit easier to add support for things like modular congestion control and scheduling uh, and things like that, because I have more of an overall view of the TCP structures underneath. So um, what does it kind of look like logically? Well, on the left here, you can see this is what, what you might get if you uh, brought up a standard uh, TCP connection. You've got your socket, uh, some protocol blocks, uh, and you send your data that way. Okay, so multipath is basically being shimmed in in between the socket and the uh, TCP layer. And what happens is that um, the multipath TCP control block contains a list of subflows. Each of these subflows is basically a socket, an internet control block, and a TCP control block uh, within. And so what does that look like in terms of uh, how does that change how TCP behaves. So here is kind of a simple uh, diagram of what TCP might look like. Um, let's say we get a data segment, okay, we may need to reassemble some data or maybe in order, in which case we can receive that or send that up to the receive buffer. Uh, we'd need to, do we need to act that? Yes, we've received the data, data segment. Uh, we may update some accounting and then we can send our ACK out that way. Okay, so how has that changed now that multipath TCP is involved? Well, let's say we've just got one subflow and a multipath control block. Okay, so our subflow, some, a, a data segment comes in. Okay, we can still act that at the subflow level, but we have some da data that needs to be delivered to an application, so we pass that up to the data level. Okay, we check the data sequence numbers at that point, reassemble if we need to. If it's in order, then we can deliver that data, um, do we need to act what we've just received? Probably, in which case we choose a new subflow and say, hey you, can you send a data act for me now? Uh, and send that out. So in terms of uh, the structures themselves, how they look, so if you were to open, if you were to create a TCP socket, you would get something that looks like this. So on that far right, you've got some socket buffers for sending and receiving data. Uh, down the middle of you've got your protocol blocks, so uh, your in PCB and your TCP control block, which is going to be tracking all of your TCP statistics or your accounting and so forth. And you've got these uh, protocol hooks down the side here, which say uh, my socket's going to send some data, so let's call the appropriate TCP function to send that data. So how it's changed now is that we basically retain, try and retain as much as possible uh, the structure of the TCP socket underneath. But what we're really giving you when you, when you ask for a so stream socket is uh, this multipath structure. So uh, a lot of it is replicated and based on what TCP was. 
So we've got our send and receive buffers now that we use uh, at the multipath layer, uh, our multipath control block there, and functions for handling sends and so forth. But now if we say try and send some new data, we can check in our list of subflows here, say run some packet scheduling, <coughs> something like that, and say, okay, I'm gonna use a particular subflow, and then we can call uh, on that subflow a TCP uh, function in order to complete that request. So I'll talk a little bit now about how the send and the receive kind of data structures have been changed a little bit. So uh, TCP, let's say we've got a send buffer and we've got a control block. UNA here is bytes that are being sent but not acknowledged. Uh, and send next is where we're gonna send next in our sequence space. So let's say we sent some data that hasn't been acknowledged yet. Okay, it eventually gets not acknowledged. We can move UNA forward, drop that, that bit off the end there, um, and so on and so forth as we work through our data stream. So as I showed before, um, basically retaining the socket structure of TCP, but kind of opening that underneath uh, multipath. So in this case, we've got a multipath send buffer, and then below we've got a couple of subflows here. Okay, each of those has their own send buffer, uh, and there are obviously TCP control blocks. And what we do is we can map uh, data using the packet scheduler into different subflows. So in this case, we've created a map, and the map says, okay, you're gonna send this much data from the send buffer. Uh, the data sequence starts at this point, so that you can put that in your TCP option, saying what the data sequence is. You've got this much data now, so you can go ahead and send that. Okay, so one subflow can start sending away. Uh, let's say we get another write coming in, and now we wanna map all of that new data to uh, another subflow. So we've mapped that to the second subflow. Uh, we can see that you know, this subflow here has sent some data in the meantime, hasn't been acknowledged yet. And now, just to show, uh, we can basically map non-contiguous data uh, onto a subflow and the subflow kind of doesn't know the difference really. Let's put another map on that first subflow there. And again, the subflows kind of act independently, so as they send data, the acts come in, uh, they drop it from their send buffer there independently. Eventually, we may get a data level act, at which point we can drop the data there. Both of these will disappear at that point and that memory is free. Okay, and what I haven't kind of illustrated on this map here, or on this diagram, sorry, is that uh, this mapping that occurs from the main send, send buffer uh, can actually be replicated across multiple subflows. So let's say we've mapped this section of data to a subflow here. We can take that same bit of data, map it to another subflow, uh, transmit them both at the same time, uh, whichever one acts us first at the data level. Uh, we can drop that. The other subflow can continue to try and send it. Um, and just drop it locally when it's when it's act at the subflow level. Yep. Yeah. So um, so okay, you dropped that first chunk off yep. the off the empty empty TCP uh, send buffer. Uh huh. Um, but then what happens when you get the you, you get the first chunk back from the uh, from the interface on the on the right there? Does it uh, Uh, so uh, don't quite just repeat that one. So, so you, you 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 sent the first part and it got and it got dropped off. Yep. Now before the rest of the, the first subflow finishes, part of the, the second subflow yep. completes and is eligible to be dropped. Right. Yeah. So uh, there's no kind of uh, basically it's cumulative the acting at the data level. You can't drop any data until. So if, for example, and, and this is part of the header line blocking. So what you're saying is that uh, if this data is sent yeah. uh, and received and, and acknowledged first, we can't actually drop it until all of this yeah. is done. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's part of the one of the issues in scheduling, really, in that you don't want to create header line blocking for yourself um, by, say, sending your first data on a slow subflow, uh, sending the rest of it on something that's quicker. Uh, that needs to be buffered at the receiver and you can't actually clear it out because you don't get acknowledgements for it. OK, 
Okay, so talking about receive uh, structures then, uh, this will kind of cover similar territory. So uh, this is what it might look like on TCP. So uh, you've got a segment reassembly list for segments that have come out of order. And let's say in this case, uh, data segment two is missing. One is being received, it's in order because that's what we were expecting. So we can append that one to the socket buffer and that can get um, sent to the application. Okay, so uh, how does that change now? So at the moment, we don't use a receive buffer uh, on any of the subflows. Uh, that may or may not change in the future, but for the moment, let's say we're receiving uh, segments, and again, we've got one, we're missing two, uh, and we've got four, okay? So there's a temporary structure here called a segment receive list. So at a point where you would generally append to your receive buffer, uh, it's putting it in this separate list here. This little S here is basically saying, I've got some MPTCP signaling, okay? It's not relevant for the subflow to process that. Um, let's say it's a data rack or something like that. What you want to be doing is passing that up to the multipath layer to process that and uh, respond to that. So in that case, we've got a segment with some signaling on it. So we're going to enqueue that one up at the same time. Okay, so at the multipath layer, we are using the receive buffer here. So, uh, but we also need to do segment reassembly. And so this kind of relates to the header line blocking stuff. So we've got our second data sequence number, so DSM2, that's kind of arrived early. Uh, we don't have one yet, so we need to buffer that. We can't acknowledge anything uh, at that point either. Okay, but now that we've received this, it's gonna be transferred from the segment received list into uh, a multipath uh, control block, which essentially uh, has a list that of, of segments that are coming in from each of your subflows and it's gonna process them a little bit like TCP do segment. Uh, we'll process incoming segments, um, if you're familiar with that. So we've got all, a bunch of subflows which will be appending uh, segments into this list here, okay? The multipath thread will eventually run uh, at some point, okay? And at that point, it will process your data levels, level segments, any signaling that's arrived, so that doesn't have any data on it, but it's got something uh, that we need to process That'll be processed at that time, okay? And reassembly is done if necessary. In, the in this case, we've got our next expected segment. So we can append those to the, to the receive buffer. Um, those can be delivered to our application. What's happened here though, is that we still haven't received um, segment two on our subflow here. Um, I'm, not gonna sh I'm not showing it here, but what can happen is if that takes too long, that subflow may go into uh, uh, retransmit, say. Uh, we may get uh, new segments again. Or at the multipath layer, we may say that this subflow is performing too slowly. Uh, let's try and trans uh, transfer um, DSM 4 and 5 on a, on a different subflow. Okay, so I kind of race through that. So um, sample topology. So. With the, with the patch, there's some documentation and there's kind of like a baby's first um, multipath topology that's described in there. And I'll kind of go through what we might expect, uh, what you might expect if you, if you do the grab attach eventually. Um, a simple experiment that you can do with some VMs uh, just to see how things work uh, and find out for yourself. So in this case, I'm just, I've got two hosts, two routers in the middle. The routers are running dummy net uh, to rate limit. <coughs> Some of these connections, so subnet one and subnet two, are rate limited to eight megabits per second. Okay, basically, host one is gonna connect to host two, uh, transfer 50 meg of data. Uh, there's no packet loss in this network, uh, so the queues are quite deep, uh, so we do get a lot of RTT. Um, and depending on what I've configured in the path manager, we may get one subflow, we may get two or three. Um, so I'll go through that. So the first example is just a single subflow. So what does a single subflow look like? Uh, if we can connect it up, okay, we've got our rate limit. Uh, there's nothing too different from regular TCP happening here. Okay, and when we look at the throughput, it looks roughly close to eight megabit per second um, and nothing much exciting happens. So what if we make it a little bit more interesting? So now let's set it up so that host one connects to both 
of the interfaces on host two. So we've got our initial connection, which is gonna be this blue one here. And then once that is established, this red line is gonna be joined into the connection. So the interesting thing here is that they're both kind of traversing a bottleneck. And again, I'm using round robin scheduling, so that's kind of the basic implementation that I've got at the moment. So essentially every time uh, the process writes some new data into the send buffer, it's just gonna stripe between the different subflows available. Okay, so we get roughly four megabit per second. Okay, well that's what we were kind of expecting. Uh, they're both sharing that same, same link. Um, they're both using uncoupled congestion control as well, I should mention, so they have their own congestion windows uh, and the multipath layer doesn't really uh, interfere with that. Okay, so what if we then try sort of an additive connection? So we've got these two separate eight megabit per second links. Uh, we'll start, again establish this blue connection first and then add in this yellow connection afterwards as an additional subflow. Okay, and so we don't quite get uh, what we would expect. Sorry, that's the wrong graph even. Oh no, so that's the per, per subflow uh, throughput. And so we're getting about six megabit per second. We'd probably uh, you know, think we'd get eight megabit per second. Uh, I'll talk a, bit, a little bit why that might not be the case here. But what we can see is that, okay, we're getting a little bit more than one of those uh, links on their own. So we're getting 12 megabit per second. Okay, so where things get, kind of get interesting, and this diagram is a little bit colorful and there's a lot of lines, but basically the path manager by default, if you say an address is available to a connection, it's gonna try and join them all up together. So in this case, we've got two, address, two addresses on each of those hosts, and they're all gonna try and connect to each other. So we wind up with four subflows. So we've got across the top here, we've got down here, the red one as before, and then we've got this extra green one which kind of connects the second address on H1 to the second address on H2. So what does that look like? Uh, well, um, it looks quite slow actually. So all of the subflows wind up doing about two megabit per second. We'd really expect to get kind of a cumulative uh, throughput of say, uh, around 16 or whatever our, our two, our two um, uh, rate limited paths are. So uh, why might this be the case? Well, if we just look at this top uh, subflow here, so if we can kind of compare what's happening with this subflow um, across, I've only got a single subflow, now I've got two subflows, now I've got four subflows. What's happening just with this one subflow in terms of the send buffer. Well, it's spending a lot of time not sending much data. And that's why, because we've got such a long RTT, uh, we've got a 32K send buffer by default, which is now being divided up each time across four subflows. Uh, this long RTT is kind of absorbing everything. Uh, we're not filling uh, the bandwidth that we should be filling up. And so basically, these subflows are spending a lot of time uh, with nothing in their send buffer uh, not sending anything. And this is kind of a, like an interesting point in terms of the kind of things that you see uh, or have to start thinking about with multipath in terms of, okay, uh, how do I handle all the aggregate traffic here? Uh, in this case, the 32K send buffer is not clearly not enough because we're not gonna service our uh, subflows uh, with enough data. So a little bit of status. Um, basically, I'm just doing the documentation and I'm doing some more kind of testing for the next patch release. So the previous patches have been a little bit buggy and been not so quite so easy to use straight up. Um, the intention this time is to make sure it works quite well. Um, it covers these kind of simple scenarios uh, with round robining, uh, with adding new addresses in. Um, and basically not at the moment using coupled congestion control, but it should essentially work and you should be able to ex experiment with it and rely on, and rely on it a little bit uh, to keep working. So I should uh, acknowledge a couple, a couple of uh, institutions at this point. So the FreeBSD Foundation, which um, has kind of done something a little bit different in terms of uh, funding my masters. I don't think it's something that's commonly done. Um, so uh, they've allowed me to continue on with this work uh, this year. Uh, again, Cisco, who has provided funding 
uh, on a couple of occasions for the multipath stuff, and of course BSD can for uh, allowing me to come in and talk a little bit about uh, MPTSB again, um, and hopefully uh, pique some interest and, and maybe uh, get some people interested in taking a look at the patch uh, in the future and maybe uh, providing comments, criticism, uh, or help in any way, which would be good. Uh, and of course, there are, there are some links here. Uh, that's my contact. That's the web page uh, where I host basically the patches and things so far. Um, the idea is that after the next release, uh, there'll be some kind of public repository where people can grab the source code. Um, but I'll update that as well because it's a little bit out of date. Um, but it, basically anything uh, to do with the project is kind of on there, all the documentation, all the patches and all that kind of stuff. Um, were there any questions? I think we have questions. Enough time for that? Yep. Hi. Uh, you said you were using CD option to make this work? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so um, I didn't talk too much about the protocol, but this is one of the things that was, in, that was considered, and so there's kind of fallback mechanisms that have been built in. So let's say we do um, uh, try and open up a new MPTC connection, and that MP-capable uh, option is stripped off because it's not recognized. Okay, from that point on, it will just continue on as a standard TCP connection. Uh, let's say we establish a TCP connection, so the MP-capable works, um, but then later on, one of the data mapping segments is dropped. Okay, so that'll be able to be detected and then it'll fall back to regular TCP. Um, so that kind of stuff, yeah, is, is, there's a lot of that and a lot of people have done testing. I haven't done much of that stuff myself, but it's kind of documented and they've spent a couple of years looking at that sort of thing um, and basically coming up with contingencies for that. Yeah, so SAC works um, pre, I haven't tested it uh, extensively with everything, but, um, sorry? Uh, yes, they should work, but I haven't tested them. Um, basically, uh, the TCPs underneath can work as the TCP worked um, previously. So the multipath stuff is just the kind of the sequence numbering and to, and to take care of uh, reassembling stuff at either end, most, mostly. Um, so stuff like SAC and all that, so SAC works still. Um, all the retransmit stuff is done uh, in a standard TCP kind of way. So, so you've got two. I've been doing a lot of this for like three years. Right. Okay. So, uh, so in terms of. Uh, uh, Congestion control works, so both senders can use congestion control. Is that, is that what you're asking? Yeah, or? Like, like there's a congestion control. Yeah. yeah. Both, well, I guess you have more than two directions going on, but does it, does it handle it as much as kind of the, the person who, you know, if you've got a lot of bandwidth this way on one, then yep. you've got a lot of bandwidth this way on the other one. Right. Oh, right, in terms of um, moving, moving data to an appropriate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so depending on the congestion control algorithm that you use, they kind of, kind of all serve slightly different purposes, but yeah, one of one of the things can be you can you can use some detection, or you can use uh, you know RTT say, uh, and and try and use that to grow the congestion window more on subflows which have more bandwidth available, uh, and you're going to send less data on, on your kind of your on your on your lower capacity link. Um, you do that with you can do that with congestion control, or you can do that with um, path management as well, or scheduling as well. So, so let's say um, you have a little bit of information about a particular a particular path and that you may want to prefer, um, you can use the scheduler to kind of map more data to that one. Right, and when you have no info? And when you have no info, you kind of have to rely on the algorithm to work. Yeah. yeah. So a bit more on asymmetries. Uh, let's say a subflow can't send, but the acknowledgement cannot come back to the same path. Can they still use another subflow? Let's say, or, I mean, can you use another IP? So you want to use a path purely for acknowledgments? Um, well, if, if, you, if, if, if you're talking about at the data level, then, then yes. Um, so if you're sending on one path, it still needs to receive its TCP level acknowledgments some way. So if that comes back via another path, but it writes up 
ends up at your right interface, then that will work. Um, you can say send your data segment uh, acknowledgments on a completely different path if you choose. You can say always nominate a particular path to send those on, if that kind of answers it. Now, but if you're talking about at, at the TCP yeah, level, yeah. Okay. Eventually, uh, one direction for one of the subsets is unavailable for a given. Yep. Then, and at that point, the, sub, the acknowledgement for that subset, if it's found within directly, it's like you have only new control bus for the new potential subset. So you have new TCP connections going on as yep. you get this you know, uh, machine layer on top of yep. it. So can this acknowledgement coming back from that subset one be piggyback on subset two so that you can still keep? Your one sending, but yet okay. Um, yeah. Um. Uh. No. So, basically, uh, in that case, if you're not getting your acknowledgements back at a TCP level, um, your sub will go into retransmit and timeout or whatever. Um, if you're talking about at the data level, if if you can't send anything back on that on that path anymore, then, then, the then it'll use the other one. Yeah. It'll use the other sub -flow. Yeah. And so what would happen is that if you're sending data, you're not getting acknowledgements back. Uh, internally, you can say, well, this subflow has gone into retransmit. Uh, let's take all that stuff that was outstanding on that particular subflow and just send it on another subflow. Yeah. But at that point, you'd be using only the bandwidth available. For, for, for the whatever's remaining, yeah. 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 Um, it can be either, generally, uh, so how I've done it and I, uh, is, is basically assume that, okay, let's, let's get the client to connect in first. Um, let's say, in the issue, I guess, if you might consider a lot of clients being behind that, so whatever, you, you can't really have the server connecting back into uh, a lot of clients. So in that case, the client, if it's multi-home, it'll connect uh, into your server, and then if it's got another address, it'll just join that in as well. Yeah, the server can advertise that it has other addresses available too. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? Nope. Okay. Uh.